Okay, thank you very much indeed for the introduction, and uh, thank you everybody for, uh, for coming along. It's great to be back. I don't know, I think some of you, I know Brian came along when I did the Goodwood talk here uh, three or four years ago, so some of you may have been to that, so uh, uh, great to be back. I'm here at uh, Bewley um, along with uh, Morris. So, uh, as you will certainly gather very quickly when Morris starts talking, uh, you'll realise that we both come from Northern Ireland, and um, Morris, these days, Northern Ireland is very much a backwater as far as uh, four-wheel motorsport is concerned, but Back in the 1950s, it was completely the opposite. The, the, the really big races actually came, uh, came to Northern Ireland. They did, and in fact, that's where it all started for me because this race you see behind me, that's the 1953 Tourist Trophy at Dundrod. So the Tourist Trophy, as you probably are aware, was a major uh, national, international event. The Dundrod circuit <coughs> was eight miles of roads on a plateau north of Belfast. And they got all the big entries. And in 53, you had Aston Martin, Jaguar, all the rest of them there. This is a Fraser Nash that you can see. It's Bob Gerrard. He's come in. He's got a punct uh, the tire, the left rear tire, as you'll see, is torn to shreds because the eight miles of uh, roads were very abrasive. But the point about this picture that I want to tell you that are really showing it is if you look at um, Red X, if I can, there we are. This Red X here, if you remember, is it was an additive. To, to fuel. Now, this man here with the hair, this wild looking man here, that's my uncle Derek, okay? <laughs> and this man here with a flat cap, that's my dad, right? <laughs> so they were there. But the important thing is this person here in the schoolboy cap is me, <laughs> age seven. So this was my first motor race, didn't know anything about it. My dad was madly passionate about motor racing. So I could, uh, some of it came from him, but he took me to this race. And can you imagine your first motor racer in the pits at an international event? So they had a Le Mans start. So they ran across the road in front of me, jumped into a car and drove off. We had all the pit stops, we had all the drama and all the rest of it. And that was my first introduction to motorsport. I just loved the whole, the smell, the noise. That was right in the thick of it. I mean, how could you not love it after that? So that's age seven. And so the, uh, the Mercedes team again came to uh, do the TT then a couple of years later then? Yeah, now, 55, this was, was really, really big. And I remember my dad being beside himself because Mercedes were coming. And they had three 300 SL. What a beautiful car, isn't it? Just a fantastic car. This is Moss. And he has had a, his, le his right rear, as, same as Bob Gerrard, has torn uh, on, the, on the abrasive surface. He's come in for a pit stop. And we had uh, Maserati there, we had everybody there. We had uh, Fangio was driving, we had Mike Hawthorne, Peter Collins, all the big names. Were. So Ascari was racing there. I got their autographs. Well, I say I got their autographs. My dad shoved me forward and said, get the autograph for the boys, for the boys, for the boys. It was actually for him. But I got all these autographs, so I was in the thick of all of this. We get home. I wasn't in the pits for this when I was in the grandstand opposite with my grandfather. When we got home, dad said, he said, you'll never believe this. He said, but I got into the Mercedes pits. Don't be daft, Dad. How'd you do that? Because it was really, it was under the control of Alfred Neubauer, the team manager here. We're going to meet him later in my story, but at the time, he was the legendary team manager of Mercedes. And, and he, very strict look, they had black sheets across the back. You saw in the other picture, it was all open, but here, it's all closed off. Very, very German-like, very, very well organized. And my dad said he's, in, he's in, the, in the pits, and we didn't believe him. The next week, this picture came out in the Motor magazine, and there he is. That was my dad. He got in. We don't know to his dying day. He didn't know how he got in, but he did. He got in. And I have to tell you that this ability to blag your way into places where you shouldn't be was something I was going to use, as you're going to hear as my story progresses, because I actually un unintentionally learned from him. So, so move, moving on then into to the mainland, most people here would associate Aintree with horses, of course, but uh, back in the day, and some of you may be aware of this, Aintree was a, was a motor racing track um, as well. So we've gone a couple of years, and you've gone over to the British Grand Prix 1959. Yeah, uh, Dad took me to my first Grand Prix in 59 at, at Aintree, which, of course, for us was very easy because you simply got on the, the uh, Belfast-Liverpool boat, got off, went up to Aintree, got the electric train. I remember being very excited. It was an electric train that they used from the Exchange Street Station out to, to entry, saw the Grand Prix. And the thing about this race was, of course, that being entry, the Grand Prix was able to use all the facilities that, you, that the horse racing course had. So you had these magnificent grandstands, which, of course, was nothing like, uh, like anything at Silverstone, for example, was, was scaffolding and planks. But here, 
it was really magnificent. So I was being introduced to Grand Prix racing in the grand manner. And uh, this race was won by Jack Brabham in a, in a, in a Cooper Climax, the, the start of the rear engine uh, revolution, if you like. And I was just drawing all this in. It wasn't a particularly great race, but the fact that it was the occasion that was the big thing for me. So we went in 59, and we went again in 1962. Mm -hmm. And this was won by Jim Clark. And I have to admit that it was actually quite a tedious race because Jimmy, here he is, walked it, he just walked the race, it, it, was, it was actually quite boring. And I remember being quite mesmerised by the fact that he had a yellow front wheel. And it turns out that that was because his teammate Trevor Tra Taylor had yellow helmet, yellow overalls, yellow wheels, and for some reason at the beginning of the race, they put a yellow, one of Taylor's wheels on Clark's car. But it was a fairly monotonous race, but you can see here how entry used the, the, the circuit. And again, it was handy for us in Northern Ireland. But after that, I had to admit that the one and a half litre cars, which this was at the time, didn't do a lot for me. They, they weren't really dramatic. They weren't really fiery and, and, and noisy like I, I thought a Grand Prix car should be. So I have to confess, I, I lost a bit of interest, Harry, because um, I was in my teens at this time. And it was, you know, music, girls, the Beatles. Uh, I used to buy the New Musical Express rather than uh, motoring news. But, so I lost interest for a while. But... It came back then, big style, in 1966. That's when the, uh, the three-litre regulations then, that then came out. Cars got a bit quicker, a bit more exciting. Bigger, noisier, faster. They called it, you just see at the top of the poster, the return of power. And this was something that we thought, we've really got to go and see. When I say we, I mean me and my, my, my mates. So four of us got into a Volkswagen Beetle and drove down to Brands Hatch, which I've never been to before, and on the night before the race, four of us slept in the Volkswagen Beetle because we couldn't find anywhere to pitch our tent because it was raining. Uh, I won't describe the state of the car in the morning, but the fact is that that's how we did it. And we were completely hooked again because Brands Hatch had never been there before, went to the first, to the Paddock Hill Bend. The first car I saw going through was Jackie Stewart in the, in the BRM V8. Then Jochen Rint came through in the Cooper Maserati, and I thought, ah, oh, this is great. This is, and we all thought this. We were really back on board with Formula One. It was reborn, if you like, in my mind. And, and, and of course, uh, the, the idol of the period, of course, very, very successful in that Formula was, it was of course, Jim Clark. He, he was, if you like, our hero, because he was um, such a, a modest guy, uh, Scottish farmer, as you may know, uh, but just super supremely talented and uh, we were so engrossed by what we saw at Brands Hatch in, in July 66 we came across again to the Gold Cup at Oulton Park later that year. Uh, I think you, you know Jim, you, Jim Clark here in a Lotus Cortina completely sideways you have to try to picture Lewis Hamilton in a Ford Fiesta you know <laughs> that, 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 that's the equivalent you know completely different back then all the top guys drove everything. They did uh, they would do sports car, there would be a sports car race, they would do that. And Jimmy, in a, in a Lotus Cortina, was just having fun. Just throwing, this is at Old Hall Corner, the first, the first corner. He was doing this every lap, completely sideways, just relaxed, enjoying himself, just fingertip control, so good. And I mean, it just raised our ad admiration for him even more. Because he could, he wasn't just a serious Grand Prix driver, he could get out and have fun. And he won that race, actually, because mm -hmm. the others all dropped out or he harried Brian Muir in the big galaxy till he made a mistake and the brakes gave up and he crashed and Jimmy won the race. Yeah, but of course it, it, it wasn't the last, unfortunately. Tragedy then uh, caught, up, caught up with Jimmy Clark. Well, in the same way that uh, a lot of you will know, you probably remember where you were when Ayrton Senna was killed 1st of May 1994 or Princess Diana or whatever, they, they, they stick in your mind. For those of us of a certain age, the 7th of April 1968 has the same effect because of this. And I can tell you exactly where I was. Uh, I can describe the, the phone when my, my a, a cream Bakelite phone in my parents' house when I had the call from my mate saying, I've heard something on the news about Jim Clark being killed in, in Germany. Now, in those days, we didn't have the news back up that we've got now. And I had to wait till the evening news came on, the BBC news came on, and Michael Aspel came on, and there was a picture of Jim Clark, and I knew straight away it had to be the fact. But even then, I didn't believe it because Jimmy seemed to be indestructible. And I bought all the papers the next day, as if to see one of them was going to say, actually, he's all right, but also trying to find out a bit more about what had happened. And it was quite 
instrumental insofar as you knew motorsport was dangerous, Harry, but when Jimmy Clark was killed, you thought it really is dangerous. And, and that year, 68, was a shocking year. Yeah, as you say, very, very similar to the impact a few decades later, that the, the, de the death of Senna, really, it was that, that generation's equivalent it of was. The, 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 the death of, of, of Ayrton Senna. I mean, even, even though uh, it was very dangerous then, because in 68, Clark was killed in April, Mike Spence was killed uh, at Indianapolis in May, uh, June was, um, June was uh, Ludovico Scarfiotti in a hill climb. These are all Grand Prix drivers doing other things. Uh, July was Joe Slesher in France. There's four killed, one every month. Mm -hmm. And it, it was something that you reluctantly had to accept was part and parcel of it. And when, when Clark was killed, it affected my thinking in that I realized it is a dangerous game. And it's not something that you, you want to talk about too much, but it was a fact and you had to accept it. Sure. So, so th thus far, you've uh, only seen motorsport in the, within the Br British Isles. First trip abroad, I think, to the to the Monaco Grand Prix. Then, yeah, 1968. Yeah, that, no, that same year, in fact. It, it was. Now, it's an interesting thing here. Uh, this Grand Prix was two to three weeks after Jimmy was killed in in Hockenheim, and here's Graham Hill in the Lotus, picking up the cudgels for the team and winning the Monaco Grand Prix and boosting the morale of, of the Lotus team, which was absolutely down when Clark was killed. You can imagine. I, I did an interview with Damon Hill um, for, the, uh, for Brooklyn's a few months ago, and of course the, the historical parallels were incredible because Graham Hill had lifted the Lotus team when Clark died, and Damon then had to do the same thing in the aftermath of the, the, the death of Senna. It was an incredible father-son parallel there. It is absolutely, Harry. And in fact, I'm sitting, so I'm in that ground, so this is, this is what is Lowe's hairpin now, was the station hairpin. Station has been knocked down. They're about to build the hotel, and this is the grandstand there. And I'm up in that grandstand with my mate Tim and a couple of other people on a Page and Moy tour. Now, where do you get this? This was a Page and Moy tour. It was a coach trip from London. It did the uh, Nurburgring 1,000 kilometres one weekend. We went to Monaco the next weekend. Back at night in Paris. How much? 16 guineas. That's just under 17 quid. <laughs> they talk about the bargain of a lifetime. So on, on to sort of slightly more mundane matters, but what, what were you doing for a living dur during this period, Morris? Well, I was, um, I was a salesman. Uh, I was actually, um, well, first of all, when I left school, uh, I was a trainee accountant, failed that. I was a trainee quantity surveyor because my dad was a, a builder, failed that. So then I started selling cars, and my mate Tim, who I've referred to, was my sales manager. So we were, we were into the business of selling cars, and that was a bit more fun, all in Northern Ireland, of course. But we was getting more and more involved. When we, went to, when we went to Monaco, we couldn't believe it. I mean, it is the most incredible place to be. The, the atmosphere, the history, the, the circus, much as it was way back in the day. And you can walk the hallowed ground, as it were. And we were staying in a hotel called the Europa. It's gone now. But if you imagine that if you come down the hill from Casino Square to uh, Mirabeau Corner, the escape road there, the hotel was down there. The McLaren team were staying in our hotel. Not only that, but their cars were garaged underneath our hotel. Can you imagine? Because in those, there was no big paddock in those days. The cars had to be garaged around the principality. So McLaren, were, Bruce and Denny were in our hotel, their cars garaged underneath. I mean, talk about being in heaven. You know, you woke up in the morning to hear an engine revving underneath your bed. It's just <laughs> fantastic. So we were really, it, it, the, 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 the blood now is really just full of motor racing. And so late 60s, obviously not, not a happy time um, for, uh, for, for, for Northern Ireland. No, uh, it's not, Harry. Um, this actually was quite a turning point for me because uh, Tim, my sales manager, and I, what we used to do was we used to go to the Gold Cup all the time. And we had a bit of a, a trick in that we would uh, take a demonstrator car from the showroom on the Friday night. We'd put it on the Belfast Liverpool boat. We'd go to Oulton Park for the Gold Cup Saturday, spend the night asleep in the, in the caravan at the back of the Red Lion in Little Budworth, which was run by a lovely guy called Dan Thornton. Get on the ferry Sunday night, back into Belfast, 6 o'clock Monday morning, drive back up to work, park the car, and nobody would know we'd been away. In, in the, <laughs> this is August 69. We got off the ferry, and we couldn't drive up to work. The, the showroom that we worked in, it was a Mercedes... Volkswagen, uh, Audi, BMW dealership was owned by a, a man called Isaac Agnew, a very astute man. When after World War II, when nobody wanted to touch the German models, he got the franchise for all the big names. 
because nobody else wanted them. And he had this showroom on the Falls Road. Now, you may have heard that name. It's a, a bit of a hot spot. And this here is, the, this is what we were greeted with when we came back. And the showroom is there, was there. It's on fire. It's the first thing that it set a light to. And we thought, hang on, this is not going to end tomorrow. Because we knew, having lived in Northern Ireland, as you would, Harry would appreciate, that this had been <coughs> under the surface a long time. And we knew that the troubles were not going to end tomorrow. And at that point, on that morning, I said to Tim, this is no good. This is my excuse. I'm going to try and get out of here and go to England and try and do something in motorsport. I don't know what, but I'm just going to get out. And this was the pivotal moment. So in terms of what, what you were going to do, uh, and obviously we know you ultimately you became a, a writer, but um, did you actually show any early promise in, in, in that sort of field? Well, have a look at that. No. <laughs> <laughs> so particularly uh, English up the top here. Uh, you know, must work harder in a weak subject. I mean, I, I had... I this, had is, this is a guy who wrote 35 books. Uh, I know. <laughs> well, he was a sarcastic old boy. This G-A-H was George Houston, my English master. And uh, he, he once wrote on, on another boy's report, um, an improvement in Thompson's handwriting has revealed the true awfulness of his work. <laughs> 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 so he had a sense of humour. And I thought he had when he wrote that, and I just had no idea, I just no wish to do I just English, no. Writing, no. There's no way I could do that. But I thought eventually maybe I was going to have to have a go at it. So, so having a go at it, the, the first step on the, on, on, on the ladder, what turned out to be a very successful ladder, I think revolved around this, uh, this long defunct magazine competition car. Yeah. So here we are, March 74. Okay, so I've been in England. I moved over to England in September 1970 to somehow I get involved in motorsport. How, I didn't know. I didn't know anybody, uh, no contacts whatsoever. I went to every race going. Uh, all my spare time was as a spectator at all the, at all the races, and from various club meetings up to Grand Prix. And, and I think you were, you were pu putting wood in the fire, as it were, by, by being a salesman again during that period, just, yeah, just sorry, to complete I, that picture. Yes, indeed. Yeah, I was yeah. uh, uh, selling office equipment for Olivetti because it got me a job in London, uh, in West Ealing, actually and uh, in my spare time going to, to the, the races. So in 73, I took my dad to Monaco. I said, you've got to come, Dad. And I knew he'd love it, and he did. And while we were sitting in the grandstand watching uh, the, the preliminaries and watching the, the build-up, I could see these people who were making a living from being in motorsport, you know, press guys with armbands on. And I'm thinking, my God, they're actually earning money doing something they love. How do you do that? I thought, well, I wonder if I could write. I wonder if, despite what Mr. Houston, my English master, said, I wonder if I could write. So during that weekend, I thought, well, all those journalists that I can see down there are going to tell the story of the Grand Prix. So there's no point in me trying to write a report. They'll be doing that. But I have never read anywhere what it's like to be at the Grand Prix as a spectator. What can you do? What can you see? Can you see the drivers? Where can you stay? So all weekend, I made notes and uh, got home, and I had a little Olivetti portable typewriter, and I pecked out this story about what it was like to be at the Monaco Grand Prix, and I, I sent it to all the magazines I could think of, and one competition car, which was a, a, a new magazine, whose editor was a guy called Nigel Roebuck. So if you know about journalists, Nigel was the editor. N Nigel went on to autosport and motorsport in, in later years. That's yeah. right. Yeah. So he said, yeah, we like your story, we're going to print it. And it appeared, there was my first article here called It Gets You Like That, meaning this is what Monaco does to you. It really gets you, it draws you in. And this is my story, my first article in print, which was a major, major moment in one way. So um, then you went off to, uh, to, to Germany, I think. This is uh, the, the Nord Nordschleife, and um, I'm sure everybody recognises the man on the right-hand side. Yeah. Youthful-looking Bernie Ecclestone. So when, when I'd been at uh, Monaco in 74, I went back in 74, um, and I was in the tip-top bar, and uh, where, you where you go, of course, uh, this is the real social centre of uh, Monaco Grand Prix, and uh, I heard a Northern Ireland accent amongst the, all the mechanics sc scrumming around the bar, and that was a guy called Gary Anderson who then went on to do great things as technical director for various teams. Who incidentally is from Coleraine, he's from my hometown, from so part I, know, of the world, I, I know his family, yeah. So I immediately made a beeline and said, hello, uh, I'm Morris Hamilton, uh, you don't know me. 
I'm trying to get involved. Um, and uh, he said, well, what are you trying to do? And I said, well, um, I, I'm just looking for something to write. And, and I feel that there's a story to be done about the life of a mechanic at a Grand Prix. Could you help me? And fair play to him, he did. And he said, right. He said he was working for Brabham. He said, he introduced me to Bob Dance, who was the chief mechanic of Brabham. And he said, this is a friend of mine, Morris. He wants to write about us. So uh, cutting a long story short, they arranged for me to go to the German Grand Prix here at the Nürburgring to write a story. I stayed with them, did the whole bit, and we had to get Mr. Eccleston's approval, right? And I was very concerned because I'd, they got me a pass to get me into the paddock. I was there, but he immediately said, who's he? Who's this bloke? And Bob Dance took me up to him and said, this is Morris Hamilton. He wants to write about us. And Mr. E looked at me up and down, looked at my pass, which the boys had got for me, and said, nodded and walked off. Which I said to Bob, what's that mean? He said, it's, it's okay. He said, <laughs> <laughs> he said, because if it wasn't, you'd be out. So anyway, I did the story on the Brabham team, uh, and I got that published as well. So again, I'm beginning to get my foot in the door, slowly. So in terms of getting your, your foot in the door in a more uh, ser serious way, you obviously need the right credentials, and you need a right, right, a right, a right pass. Th thus far, your track record is, you're getting there, but you're still a little bit th thin on credentials. So what, what's, what's the next? <laughs> Yeah, this, I'm not particularly proud of this, but anyway, um, when I went to the Grand Prix uh, and tried to get in, they'd say, who are you? Well, I'm Morris Hamilton. Uh, well, who, well what are you, who do you write for? Well, I'm, tr I'm trying to get involved. I'm trying to become a journalist. Well, uh, have you got credentials from your national authority, from, from the RAC in Great Britain, to say you're a, jur a, a, a journalist? I said, no. Well, you bring a letter from them, and we will give you a pass. So I went to the RAC MSA and I wrote to them and I said, can I have a letter saying I'm a, uh, uh, giving me credentials for a Grand Prix? And they said, no. <laughs> what do you mean? They said, well, you're not a journalist. I said, I know I'm not, but I want to become one. And I can, I'll become one if you give me a letter that will get me into the foreign Grand Prix. No, I can't do that. What am I supposed to do? I don't know. Tough. So I had to go away and think about what the hell am I going to do? It so happened. And these things happen in life, don't they? This crossroads. I was going through Victoria Station. It was midweek. I don't know where I was been, but and the, the, you know the vast concourse in Victoria Station. And in those days, uh, the uh, security passes which we've got now, which are everybody's got, in those days they were very new. And there was a little company making security passes for businesses. And I was looking at at these, and the bloke came up to me and he said, "Can I help you?" And I said, uh, "Yeah, I think you can actually." He said, oh, how many employees do you have? I said, one. I said, sorry, you want a security pass for yourself? He said, no. What I want you to do is I'd like you to make me what looks like a press credential. I said, what do you mean? And I explained the story, and he said, oh. And it was quiet, and he obviously liked the idea. And he said, OK. So he said, uh, what's your name? And we go, oh, I went to the, the, the booth, put the money in, got a picture, got that done. And then he said, uh, where do you live? And I lived in, at that time, I was living in Dorking. It was Harrow Road West. And he said, that's not very romantic. So I knew a guy. I don't know if anybody knows a guy called Tony Tobias. Tony Tobias is in his 80s. He did advertising in motorsport. He's been around for donkey's years. And going back to Competition Car Magazine, he handled the advertising. And he was a real whiz guy. He knew everybody. But I knew <coughs> that, that uh, Tony Tobias' mother ran a sweet shop in King's Road. Mrs. Tobias' sweet shop, it was called. And I rang Tony, and I told him what I was doing, and I said, can I borrow your mum's shop address, because it'll look good in this card. Yeah, yeah, he said, of course. And he gave me the phone number, 01352 <laughs> So we put all that down, and then the guy said to me, what do you want to put in the back? I said, I don't know. Oh, uh, gosh. Um, oh, well, look, have you got a name? I said, no. So we, on the spot, we made up Motor Racing News Service. So we made up, that was the name of my company, suddenly. He said, well... Can you put anything else? And I said, well, I've done one feature for a magazine in Japan called Autosport. Right, we'll put that in. We then put Autosprint in Italy, which I'd never written for. Auto Ebdo in France, which I'd never written for but wanted to. And I said, God, we, you know, I could, I could be in serious trouble here with these magazines. So I'll tell you what we'll do. For a bit of a laugh, we'll put the last one, cart and track brackets Ireland, like cart as in horse and cart. <laughs> And I can say if I'm, if I'm cornered, it's a joke, it's a joke. It's not serious, it's a joke. Anyway, we did it, cost me 50 pence. 
turned out to be the best 50 pence I ever spent because I used this very pass here and a lot of chat to get this, a track pass at Monaco. The real McCoy? The, the real thing. And the guy would go, but this, what is this? Oops, no, go away, go away, go away. So uh, I went away. I thought, well, I'm, not going anywhere. I'm not going anywhere else. I'm, not, I'm here for the weekend. I went back, kept going back and forth. And on the, two day, on the second day, he went, oh, OK, 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 and gave me the pass. And I used this again to get into the Dutch Grand Prix, the German Grand Prix. Uh, and it got me places where I should never really have been. But the important part was I was in the paddock, and the people that mattered were going, how did you get in? And I told them the story, and they went, whoa, OK. So at least they could see I was reasonably serious in a certain way. So um, a lot of people may, may remember the name Ian Young, a uh, very, very prominent uh, motoring journalist. And he, uh, he came into your life, became a very influential figure in your, your next steps within journalism. Yes, uh, he, he did, because um, Ian was one of the guys who would see me around at the paddock and say, how did how, you manage to get in? And I told him, and being a Kiwi with a terrific sense of humour, he, he liked this and he, and he sort of looked after me and, and made sure I was fed and watered at the Grand Prix and all the rest of it. But it became apparent, he said to me, look, you're still a salesman. You're not really a, you know, a, a journalist. You should become one uh, full time. I said, how, how am I going to do that? And he said, well, I'm a freelance writer, but he was doing PR as well at the same time. He was doing PR for Tyrrell Team, which was just down the road from him in East Horsley. He said, I need an assistant. He said, now, I can't afford to pay you much. It was £3,000 a year he was going to pay me. But he said, I get my expenses paid to go to the Grand Prix. You can come with me. And what he did was he was getting first class, because in those days it was first class and economy. There was no business class. He was being paid first class by ELF, as an ELF Team Tyrrell. And he would go economy and use that money to take me with him. So he took me to the Grand Prix. I, I quit my job as a salesman on the 31st of uh, December 1976, 1st of January 77. I'm a freelance writer working with Ian. And, and so this is a big change in my life. So, so we gave you a pretty tasty project to get your, get your uh, still fairly inexperienced teeth into. <laughs> yeah, I'll say so, Harry. Yeah. Um, uh, Ian had won the contract. This, this, the James Hunt magazine was probably, arguably, the first fanzine of its kind. And uh, James, being James, did, and his brother, uh, Peter Hunt, had thought this up. Let's do a magazine, because James was the reigning world champion at this point, as you know. And Ian had got the contract to write it. So he said to me, you're writing it. And I said, fine, fine. So it meant I was going to have to work with James Hunt. And how, how did you find that? How was James? He was a fairly notorious sort of guy to, uh, to work with. It was purgatory. <laughs> <laughs> it was awful. Uh, you know, here's my hero, who I'd followed avidly. I'd, I'd followed him all the way through 76 when he won the championship. I went to Watkins Glen and Mossport off, on, on my own account. Uh, saw him win there. He was absolutely brilliant. I thought I'd be working with James Hunt. And the problem with James was uh, he, he, didn't, he enjoyed driving, but he didn't like what came with it. He didn't like all the pressures that came with being world champion. He couldn't cope with it. He found it very hard. And as a result, he'd be very rude and very offhand. And he had a pretty bad reputation. And even though this magazine was for him, I was kept waiting for hours outside the Marlborough McLaren motorhome to, to see him. He'd go, oh, sorry, yes, what, what, yeah, oh, let, let's do a bit. And it was really, really hard work. Saying that, in uh, 10 years after that, in, in 86, when he'd long since retired, I went to do an interview with him and talk about how his attitude had been at this time, and he admitted that he'd been impossible to work with. And in fact, uh, until his death in 93, we actually became the best of mates. So I knew two James Hunts. I knew this dreadful bloke, and I knew one of the best guys you could ever wish to know. And Murray Walker tells a similar story, doesn't he? How his relationship with him kind of transitioned over the, over the, over the years, how he, how he changed. Yes, right. So um, you, you're now going down the path of a, of a dedicated specialist uh, motor racing writer, but rather unusually, um, you also got involved in newspapers as well, because normally the journalists are either, either one or the other, but you actually ended up with getting a foot in, in, in both camps. So how did, how did the newspaper career um, get, get going? Yes, that's an interesting question, Harry. Um, I, I was working with Ian, and it was all very well. I was getting little jobs to do with him, and I was getting the odd feature to write for magazines and so on. But it was Morris Hamilton, uh, who, who's he? So uh, Ian said to me, you really need a handle to your name. You really need to be with somebody, be it a newspaper or be it a magazine. 
And a magazine, with a magazine, you'd have to be on the staff. And I didn't want to be on the staff. I wanted to be a freelance. Newspapers, there were more openings because they were looking for freelance writers. And it so happened that a guy called Eric Dimmock, uh, who wrote the great book about Jim Clark, you may know the name, uh, he had been the Guardian's motorsport correspondent for 12 years, and he wanted to move on and do other things. And he took me to one side. And it was all about, of course, it's all about who you know, isn't it? It's all about as much as what you know. It's about when you're in the inside, you, you get seen, you get known. And Eric came up to me and he said, uh, look, I'm going to quit. The first thing the Guardian is going to do is ask me, well, d who's going to replace you? Because the sports desk and all the national newspapers, they know about football, they know about all the big sports, but they don't know about motor racing. They don't know anything. And they're going to ask me to, to nominate somebody, and I'm going to nominate you. I said, but Eric, I have had no training whatsoever, no journalistic training, no experience in newspapers, nothing. He said, doesn't matter. He said, come with me. I'll come with you for the interview. We'll wing it. So I said, <laughs> OK, fair enough. And we went for the interview with the, with the uh, sports editor of The Guardian, who was a rather pompous little man. And all he wanted to do was talk about himself and talk about the car he drove and talk about how he'd done this. He was heavily into skiing, and he talked about skiing and all the rest of it. And then he said, oh, uh, so anyway, boy, um, uh, yes, yes, OK, Eric recommends you, yes. Have you written for a newspaper before? And I said, I took a deep breath, and I said, yeah. And he moved on, thank God. Because if he'd asked me, what's your experience writing for a newspaper before, I would have had to admit it was putting an ad in my local paper for my bicycle. That was all I'd ever written before. <laughs> I'd done nothing at all. So I bluffed my way, and I got the job. But that was really the start of the hard part. Yeah, and so, um, of course, b back then, of course, before uh, word processors and voice dictation and all the rest of it, um, you, you, um, but I think even you, especially among your colleagues, you acquired a... Uh, a reputation for doing things longhand. Mm. Yes, uh, even though I, I had my portable typewriter, um, in those days, as you say, before computers really came in, and I used to prefer just having a sheet of A4 paper and writing. This is the 1988 German Grand Prix, uh, my piece for, for, for The Guardian, or it was then The Independent, actually, I was writing for. But I would do it longhand. The problem you had was that you had to dictate your story over the phone to a copy taker. So now a copy taker, I don't know if anybody here is uh, associated with a copy taker, but they are a breed apart, or they were. They, they don't exist anymore. But they would sit in a room uh, with a headset on, a typewriter, and the call would come through, and there would be, might be polit a, polit a political writer one minute, it might be the tennis writer the next, it might be me with filing a motorsport story, and they would go, yeah, yeah, and you would dictate, I would read that out, and dictate it over the phone in a noisy press room with a lot of racket going on. And you had to queue up to get your call put through because, of course, your call had to be collect, reverse charge, because there's no way you could afford to pay for a 20-minute call from Spain or wherever you were. And the, the, the switchboard on the newspaper would always accept a transfer charge call. So you had to go and, f and queue up to get this put through. You might wait 20 minutes to get put through. You start to get put through, and the copy ticker, if they were stroppy, and a lot of them were, and they couldn't hear you, or it was noisy, they'd go, can't hear you, and flick the switch, and you had to go to the back of the queue and do it all again. And meanwhile, time is running out. You're on your deadline. It was very, very hard work. And uh, also, I think, right for potential misunderstandings, if you've got a copy taker typing down stuff that doesn't know the industry and doesn't know oh, what yeah. you're actually saying. Yeah, there's, there's I mean, <laughs> yes, the sub-editors on the newspaper had to be very uh, alert to the copy taker, not really listening. Uh, and there's two cases. One for me was in, um, let me get this right, in 1983, I was at 84, 85. Williams, uh, the Williams team, changed engines during the season, which is very, very unusual. They, they, they started to use the Honda engine for the first time towards the end of 83. That's right. 83. And for the f final couple of races, they were suddenly using a Honda. They'd been using a Ford before. So normally the sub-editors are very bright. They're, very, they're, they're on the ball, and they're, they're used to saying something wrong. But they weren't ready for this. And um, the, the copy taker, with my accent saying, Keke Rosberg driving a, a, a Williams Honda, it appeared, actually appeared in, the, in print, that he was, Keke Rosberg was driving a Williams Humber. <laughs> <laughs> Which led to all sorts of jokes about a walnut dashboard and chrome <laughs> wing mirrors and, and all the rest of it. And another things that have got in, uh, one football writer was telling me about one where uh, it was an FA Cup replay, and uh, he had said 
that the uh, replay, Saturday, Tuesday's replay, will be in the self sim arena. <laughs> it actually appeared in the paper as Tuesday's replay will be in the South Sea Marina. <laughs> <laughs> So that's the problem that you had with copy takers. They had to be on your side. They had to be listening. Jim Bamber, my, my dear friend, who was, who, when I worked as editor of Autocourse, he did all the artwork, and I got him to start doing cartoons, and this is one he did for me when I told him this story about dealing with these copy takers and about how they would just lose interest if your story was a bit boring <laughs> and almost fall asleep. Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. Great. So um, you're obviously uh, getting yourself well established and getting a proper uh, recognition through both the specialist press and, as we said, the, the newspaper side of things. Very unusual for, uh, to combine both of those. So having faked uh, a few passes along the way, I, I assume this is actually a genuine one. It is. It is. That was a big moment um, because this was before Bernie took charge of controlling everything. And um, the, the, what would happen was you would... Uh, a journalist would have to write to every Grand Prix, to the press officer of every Grand Prix, saying, I want to come to your Grand Prix. Uh, I'll be covering for such and such and such and such. And you'd get a reply back from the press officer of each Grand Prix saying, yep, we'll give you a pass. You'd bring that letter with you to the accreditation centre and you'd get your pass. It was a long, drawn-out process. A man called Bernard Caillé, who was a photographer, uh, decided that he would smooth all this out and he formed what he called the International Racing Press Association. And he did deals with everybody. He was a real wheeler dealer. And he did a deal with um, a, an it Italian leather company to make these armbands. And to get into the International Racing Press Association, you had to do a minimum number of Grand Prix. You had to sign every, every race you went to to get into it. And then once you got that, that was accepted by the Grand Prix worldwide. That was the great thing. So no longer did you have to apply to each one. You would arrive at the gate, show that, and you were in. So I had to do my apprenticeship. I had to do my two years of uh, signing on, and I got that. I remember being so chuffed getting my first leather armband. That was a really, really big step. You know, you've arrived to the point where I must have over-egged up my mum and dad because um, when I came home from my next visit in Northern Ireland, they got a big piece in my local paper about uh, Banger Man, I'm from Banger County, Banger Man makes International Press Association. It was <laughs> as if I'd really done something big. Lo local, <laughs> local boy makes good, as, yeah, they, as, exactly. as, as they say. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, another, another skill that you developed um, looks unbelievably complex, L lap charting. Obviously, these days, it's all completely defunct, all done completely electronically nowadays. But um, back in the day, you had to do your lap charts by hand. You did, because there was, there was no computers, uh, there was no way of knowing uh, what went on. So you could have a 70-lap race, you have to write a report at the end of it, and try and remember what happened on lap 35, or lap 36, or when did Nigel Mansell pass Nelson PK? What lap was it on? What position were they in? So you had to keep a lap chart, and this is a typical one here. This is the 79 British Grand Prix, I think. So. You, you get a technique of doing it um, because obviously, and I, you, you may know Dennis Jenkinson, the, the famous uh, journalist who uh, co drove a Sterling Moss in the Million Million in 1955. Jenks was kind of looked after me. He, he was a wonderful old guy. And he gave me the secret about keeping, because he, he kept meticulous lap charts. And what you would do on the first lap, because when they're coming by, you know, 20 cars. You've no idea. So you have a scrap of paper and you're, just, you're scribbling down without looking down, just writing the numbers down, and then transfer them into your lap chart. By the time you've done that, they're around for the second lap, do the same thing again. Then they start to get spread out. Then you can start to put them into the lap chart. And he gave me this little codes like a line down the side means they're very close together. A line underneath means there's quite a gap between the two. And, it, and it's telling the story uh, of, of what's going on. And so this was such an important thing. And also, it, it got me into, uh, if I dig digress slightly, Harry. Thank you, sure. Um, uh, a, a guy called Simon Taylor was doing, um, was doing commentary for, it was the BBC Light program, then became BBC Radio 2, um, on the Grand Prix. And uh, Simon would need, he, 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 had a, he had a little box, a TV screen, but he needed a lap chart. So I used to keep Simon's lap chart, which was great because I could see the TV pictures, I could see them passing on the pit straight to keep my lap chart, and I could show him what was going on. And that led to one uh, in 1988, uh, 1989, 
uh, the BBC said to him in one race, look, Simon, you know, we normally only come to you for 30 seconds to a minute at the start, 30-second uh, intervals during uh, the news bulletins and so on, and then an, a minute or two for the finish. There's not a lot else happening in sport today. We're actually going to come to you quite a bit. Have you another, is there another voice? I mean, no, no disrespect, Simon, but we could do it with another voice. And Simon looked around at me and said, would you like to do it? I said, all right. And I did, luckily didn't have time to think about it or worry about it. And the next thing I knew, I'm a co-commentator with Simon Taylor, and that led to 20 very happy years with um, BBC Five Live. But thanks to the fact that I was doing lap charts, got me into the right position to do it. And lap charts also got me somewhere else, didn't they? Yeah, got, got, you, got you another position, sort of unofficial uh, position with, uh, with the Williams team, 82, I think. 82, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So there I am, there. Now, the Williams pit is the holy of holies, right? The, the media were not allowed in at all. And this is Las Vegas, 1982, the climax of the World Championship. Keke Rosberg, the Williams driver, is in the fight for the championship. And there were open pits at Las Vegas then. And here's Frank, the old Frank Williams. So there's Frank Durney there. Um, various other people, Charlie Crichton Stewart here. Mm -hmm. And Frank came to me and he said, I normally keep the lap chart during the races, but because this is the championship finale, he said there's be a lot going on, we've got pit stops, I won't be able to keep a lap chart. Will you keep the Williams lap chart for us? And I had to talk about a double-edged sword because I thought I'd, it'll get me right into the Williams pit in the midst of the championship finale, but they are going to be looking at me to know where Keke is in the race. They're going to rely on me totally. This had better be right. And I'll tell you what, where I'd, the heat that was very, very hot, and I was perspiring profusely down then, keeping my lap chart. But what an experience that was. And Frank, having the trust in me to do that, was, uh, you know, and I saw, and I, I obviously I got the whole story from the Williams point of view, which was absolutely brilliant. Yeah, oh, it, was, it was an epic championship end, wasn't it? Yeah, and so obviously a lot of trust shown in you by, by, by Frank Williams. So yeah, so th things are very d different these days, but um, typical <laughs> picture of a, of a kind of a, a, a press pack at the end of a Grand Prix. Yeah, so here, this is the 1983 Dutch Grand Prix. So again, we're before computers, we're before a decent press room. So to keep, to watch the race, you had to stand outside. So this is uh, Tarzan, the, the, the corner at the end of the straight. Um, and here we are, there's, there's me. That's Nigel Roebuck. That's Bob Constantinuris, the international commentator. This is Nelson Piquet's Brabham here, which had a collision with Alan Prost's Renault. So they just parked the car there and carried on the race. They didn't stop the race. I mean, today, that would be a safety car, bring everything to a halt, bring the, drag the car in. No, they just left it there and carried on. So that's what we were doing, and that's how you watched the race. That's how you followed it, all the media pack with the photographers up the back and all the rest of it. So that's how you had to do it. And then when the, the excitement is all over, then uh, type, yep. ty typing up your, your report then on yep. your, again on your little portable Olivetti. Yeah, yeah, sitting with a little typewriter to carry with you to do the race report. So again, that's uh, Brazil, um, probably 79, 80-ish, I think. And if you look, again, at the facilities there, you, you were lucky to get a table. You had to nab a table as soon as you put in and put your name on it, stick your name on it, uh, to have somewhere to sit, because otherwise you wouldn't have anywhere uh, when you really needed it. So if you compare that to, I think, here is the Dutch Grand Prix last year. This is the current media centre. Look at the difference. Because here, they've got, they don't, they don't if the, the, the journalists now don't go out, they never leave the media centre, which in a way is a bad thing, because they're not getting the flavour of it. Because they've got everything that they need. They've got the, uh, the race positions, they've got the incidents being flagged up here, they've got the TV pictures here, they've got all sorts of information, gaps and so on here. Uh, and of course, you've got internet connections, you've got all you need, you, you, and a lot of them are plumbed into TV commentary and so on. So you, don't, you, you really can't afford to leave the media centre now if you're a journalist. And to me, uh, although it's terrific, and you've got all the information you would need to write an in-depth report, there's nothing like, the, you, they're not experiencing what it's like out in the track. They're not experiencing, you're not able to experience the noise of the crowd. I mean, you go to somewhere like Brazil, uh, Interlagos. Ah, oh, it's phenomenal, the atmosphere there. It's just, and Monza, that's another one. So when you're out on, the, on track side, keeping a lap chart at Monza, and it, it's wonderful because you're, you, you're right in the heart of it all and you're being sucked up by the, the whole atmosphere. It's, it's brilliant. So this is quite clinical in its way, but very effective, obviously. 
But and also another big difference, of course, is that I mean, back in your day, particularly people like Nicky Lauder, who we'll come on to later on, that spoke their mind and spoke relatively freely. Of course, these days, everybody is so constrained by the, by the PR people and so forth that even if these journalists were out and about talking to drivers, they, they wouldn't really get anything out of them much, would they? Well, no. I mean, that's right, Harry. I mean, if, if you go back to James Hunt, um, <laughs> say back, so back in 76, 77, if you wanted to do an interview with James Hunt, there, were no, there was no such thing as press officers then, no such thing as PR people with each team. You, you would hang around at the paddock gate, see James come in on the, on the Friday morning, and say, hi, James, how are you doing? OK, he said, listen, James, I've, Autosport want me to do an interview with you. Yes, old boy. Um, come after practice, and we'll, we'll, we'll do it. No problem. The downside of that was he'd forget, or he'd meet <laughs> a lady, and he'd be off somewhere else. Uh, and you would see him the next morning, oh, sorry, forgot, forgot. And you might go through the weekend and not get your interview. But if you did get it, if he was, if he did remember or you got him, you would sit down, the two of you, there'd be nobody else there, it would be man to man, as it were, and he would trust you. Uh, you could say things to him, James, I really need to know about Jochen Maas. What's, what's, what's the story? Well, look, off the record, it's this, this, and this. It's just so you would have the full picture in your head without really making a fool of yourself. And he would trust you. Today, if, say, I want to see Lewis Hamilton, and I'm not just picking on, on Mercedes, it's the same for all the top teams. You have to email the press officer, of which there are now four in each team, four, uh, the chief press officer, and say, uh, I'd like to talk to Lewis. It'll be uh, about, for this magazine or for whatever it might be, its circulation is this, they're going to do this with it, that with it. And if you're lucky, you will get a reply saying, yep, you can come and see Lewis uh, between 19 minutes past 4 and 4.30 on Thursday. Okay? And you would go, and he would be there. That's the difference with him and James. He would be there. He would sit down, but the press officer would then have their tape recorder and they'd put it on the table beside yours. So Lewis would know that anything he says is being recorded. He's not going to be able to tell you anything off the record. It, that just doesn't happen anymore. Oh, so it's uh -huh. all, and again, no disrespect to Lewis, the same with all the drivers, it's all anodyne, um, speak that just comes out, just party line comes out. It's, it's not really what you need, and that's the difference between then and now. It's a massive difference. And he's, he's gone now, of course, but in recent years, um, Nicky Lauda was a real antidote oh, to that. God, he, he, he never really conformed with that, he did he? He used, to he, used to, he used to drive the PR people and the team managers mad, because he would just, oh, car shit, okay, no good, okay, but, but he would just come directly out with, with whatever he had to say, and he didn't care. He just, if it's the truth, well, he said if it's the truth, I'll tell you the truth. So he did. So you developed um, a good relationship with Williams, as we saw, but also worked quite closely with uh, Ken Tyrrell. And here you are with, uh, with Ken Tyrrell and his driver in the early 1980s, uh, De Derek Daly. Mm. Yeah, Derek Daly being Irish, obviously, was um, quite an asset because it's good. You, you, you've got some sort of relationship. Although uh, I did learn very early on uh, from my mentor, Ian Young, uh, one of the pieces of advice he gave me was that... Um, Ian, being a Kiwi, had come into motorsport with Bruce McLaren. Bruce McLaren being, obviously, the, uh, the founder of the McLaren team, raced for Cooper. He was the driver to Europe from New Zealand, and Ian had been covering Bruce's races in New Zealand and come with him, had, had grown up in Formula One with Bruce, had been really, really close to Bruce, and Bruce was killed at Goodwood in 1970, and Ian was devastated. And he said to me, uh, when he took me under his wing, he said, keep them at arm's length. Don't get too close because, it, A, you won't be able to write uh, a, an objective piece because you're too close, and B, if something happens, you, you will not be able to do your job. So I took that advice on board, and with Derek, we, we were good friends, but we just kept it at that. You know, there was no, I didn't live in his pocket, which a lot of some journalists tend to do, because it just doesn't work. I think uh, you did a column for him or something, didn't you? In, I did. In, in an Irish newspaper. I, I did. That's two best wishes from, from Derek, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah we did. I, I ghosted a column for him. And uh, yeah, he, he was a super guy. Uh, it was just nice for me to get some of the in, inside line from him. But again, keeping each, each other at arm's length, because it suited us supposed to do that. So we have a little sort of career crossover, because um, I also worked with Derek Daly, but it was 30 years later. and. Uh, when you uh, obviously were interviewing him there, he had a great, great head of hair, 
but uh, when I raced with Derek in the Goodwood Revival 30 years later, he'd uh, changed a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> That's Derek on the right. <laughs> yes. De Derek and I raced uh, a Sunbeam Rep here in uh, 2012 in the, uh, in, in, the, in the Revival. So, um, you're the author of, uh, of 35 books. So, we, we talked about the mainstream press, we talked about newspapers. So, uh, let, let, let's have a look at books. So, where, where did that start? Um, out of the blue, again, um, I had a, uh, a publisher come to me and say uh, we could do with a book on the history of the British Grand Prix. Thought, okay. And um, one thing led to another, and I sat down and thought about it and did it and thoroughly enjoyed it. Found, made a lot of mistakes, learned the hard way. And then once you've had something published, other publishers see your name and they'll come to you because they'll think, oh, well, he must know what he's talking about. And in 1994, which this picture relates to, um, Damon was going to do, he was in the running for the championship. He was going to be teammate to Ayrton Senna. It'd be quite a story. And Macmillan, the publisher, came to me and said, we have got Damon's agreement, but he obviously doesn't want to write it. Could you ghost a book with them and where you're going to talk to them after every Grand Prix and we're going to file it after every Grand Prix so that, believe it or believe it not, the final Grand Prix of 94 was in Adelaide in November, beginning of November and we had the book out by Christmas because we had everything ready right up to the last race. This here is on the roof of the Adelaide Hilton Hotel the morning after the 1994 Australian Grand Prix when Michael Schumacher and Damon Hill have had the collision, and Michael Schumacher <coughs> wins the Grand Prix. And it was really interesting, this, because Damon was a, is, a, is, a, is a, um, quite guarded and quite keeps himself to himself. And despite the fact that I would go up to his house after every Grand Prix on a Monday or the Tuesday, when he was then living in, in South London, do an hour and a half, it was very businesslike. Uh, there was never any sort of idle chat or anything like that. On this particular occasion, on the Monday after he'd lost the World Championship under very uh, contentious circumstances, um, we had to go through it. And I realized, as he's talking to me in the hotel room, down below if this, where this picture was taken, uh, he was actually allowing himself to recount it for the first time because he didn't want to think about what had gone on in the race. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it, it actually got quite emotional because if you think about it, you've done, and in those days it was 18 races, you've been right through the season, you've been through the ringer, Ayrton Senna's been killed, you've had to take over responsibility, which you weren't expecting, you were expecting to learn from Ayrton Senna, you're suddenly in charge, you win the Spanish Grand Prix, you find that Renault actually don't think you're up to the job, they bring Nigel Mansell in. He went through a real ringer of emotions during that year, and he comes to the end of it, he has the most brilliant race at the previous one in Japan in the wet, his best drive by far, in my view. Yes. Okay. And he's, he's in I, the... I, asked, I asked him that question, actually, at Brooklyn's land. He, he agrees, actually. Did he? Yes, oh. he, he agrees that as well, yeah. yeah. Phenomenal race. Because if, if he'd, it was wet, and if he'd gone off, everybody would have written him off. But he won the race under incredibly difficult circumstances to be in the running for the championship. Be that close. And then Shuey has him off uh, during the Grand Prix. So it all came out. And... Um, We'd been doing this book, as I say, all year, and John Nicholson, who was the photographer, was a great friend of, of Damon's, which was part of the key to it all. And I said to John, John, I want a picture of me and Damon, please, just from Owen Records. We get to the last race, he still hasn't taken the picture. So on the morning after the race, I said, John, I want the picture now, so we, we had no option but to go up onto the roof. And we took this picture here, the two of us, uh, on the roof. So it was, um, yeah, quite a, a roller coaster year. He looks uh, remarkably relaxed there, bearing in mind what he's, what he's gone through he in the preceding bit, 24 hours. He looks a bit exasperated with me, I think. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And uh, rather remarkably, there was a, a chap around a bit of space near me, and um, he had a big box of stuff that he takes to auto jumbles and things, and was having a flick through some of his books in his auto jumble. And what did I find? The British Grand Prix by Morris Hamilton, a copy of your very first book. There you go. So there you go. Long, yeah. long since out of print, but if you go to an auto jumble, you might, you might pick one up. Uh, we have another sort of slight overlap here because I worked for Eddie Jordan as well, way, 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 way back when. But um, what did you do? I was just a gopher on the team and stuff. Formula Three, you know. I, I slept in the back of his pickup one night, and he turned up at Mallory Park and found me in a sleeping bag in the back of Eddie Jordan's pickup. <laughs> <I know that. laughs> yeah, it's in my book. You haven't read no, my no, book. No, Come no, on. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
So yeah, so so Eddie, so Eddie Jordan, tell tell us about your work uh, with uh, with the Jordan team. Oh, fantastic! Uh, I did two fly on the wall years, uh, ninety three and this one, ninety eight, and uh, I, I I went. To, I, I've been inspired by um, a book uh, written in nineteen seventy about the March team, called The Checkered Year by a guy called Ted Simon. Fantastic book because it really went inside the team and told the whole story of what was going on. And Simon had the advantage of, um, he wasn't a motor racing guy, and uh, he was able to write the story and then get on his bike and go and tour the world. It didn't matter what he'd said, because they couldn't get him. I was, around, I was going to face the music no matter what, but I went to Eddie and I said, I'd love to do an inside fly on the wall story of, 90, of Jordan in 93, which we did. And it was really very successful. Mm -hmm. So uh, five years on, I asked to do it again, because Damon is now driving for Jordan, and it's going to make a nice story. And he agreed. And to be fair, uh, they had a shocking start to, to 98, really, really bad, to the point where the publisher, this book should have been hardback, and the publisher actually said to me, they're having a terrible year. Uh, we want to pull it. I said, no, we can't. I've started the book. I'm, I'm, I'm well into it, and I've got the, the, the team around my side. And they agreed to do it in softback. And then blew me down. Don't they go and finish first and second in the uh, Belgian Grand Prix that Belgian year? Grand Prix, yeah. So suddenly uh, we've got a fantastic story. But throughout, Eddie never flinched, even though he would kind of something would go wrong and he'd, he'd look at me and look at what I was writing. And, but he never tried to stop me, to be fair to him. Okay. So it is half past now, uh, Morris, so uh, we, we were told strictly just to yep. stop at that point. So we'll, we'll, we'll stop for our break. Uh, uh, we, we do have more, Morris has another excellent uh, Eddie Jordan story in his pocket, but. Um, We'll, we'll tempt you with that one uh, after, after the break. Okay, so thanks very much, everybody. <laughs> when, when we broke there, Morris, you were just telling us about the, uh, the Jordan team book that you, that you wrote. Um, you also collaborated with uh, Eddie Jordan on his biography, which, which he, in fact, thinks is an autobiography. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I call The Independent Man. And uh, Eddie wanted to do, have a biography. He wanted to do an autobiography, which I agreed to ghost. And it was a heck of a job because if, for example, um, we would sit down and I'd say, right, today, Eddie, we're going to talk about Formula 3, your time in Formula 3. Oh, yes, right, right, right. And so off you go. So it's, uh, and talk about Formula 3. And then he would just digress. Uh, and, you know, that reminds me of something else. And off he'd go over here. And, go, and he might say something that he would never say again or forget to tell me. So I'd have to hear it through. And then I'd bring him back. Anyway, listen, we're talking about... Yeah, Formula 3, right, right. Anyway, so then in 79 we did this and then we, did, and then we went to Phoenix Park and then I'll tell you what about Phoenix Park. And off he'd go about Phoenix Park. And on, 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 on. I think I'll bring him back to Formula 3. Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. So in the end, uh, where I'm looking for, say, that amount of text, I've got that amount that I've transcribed and I've got to sub it right down to this. We did a chapter on football, a chapter on golf. The golf is, is dialogue on golf, but on and on and on and on, huge, which had to be brought down to this, really subbed and I had to do a, a big job on it. And to this day, <laughs> Eddie thinks he wrote every word, and he, did. <laughs> <laughs> and he didn't. But that's Eddie, you know, I just, it's a great book that, I love that, yeah. So no, another uh, well-known personality did a, did a book on uh, Ken Terrell, his bi this was the authorised biography. Yes, this was uh, a very personal thing for me, um, because uh, as I may have said earlier on, uh, Ian Young, my mentor, was based in East Horsley, and the Tyrrell racing team was not far away, 10 minutes away. So Ian was doing a lot of work, and by association, I was ending up down in Tyrrell's yard quite frequently uh, in Green Dean, in, in, um, in Longreach, uh, Ockham. And uh, the very first, when, when, when Ian took me under his wing in 77, the first Grand Prix we went to was a South African Grand Prix. And uh, I said, I'd like to interview Ken Turles for my first interview. So Ian arranged for me to talk to Ken. And Ken said, right, we'll go to dinner. Uh, it, was a Saturday, it was a Friday night, because the race was on a Saturday. Friday night, we'll go to dinner. Come, we're staying at the Kalami Ranch, which is a wonderful place. Come for a gin and tonic before we go out to dinner. So we had two gins and tonic. Uh, we're over an hour doing the interview. Uh, and we went off, and uh, that set the seal in that he became a kind of surrogate father to me, keeping an eye on me. He was very blunt, was Ken. Um, you, you would, uh, there was never any preamble when he phoned you. 
Um, so uh, maybe I've written something, and you'd, uh, you'd pick the phone up, and you'd go, hello, and you'd go, nice pace, bang. No. <laughs> that would be it. You got a pen? Hello? Go, go, go. Or you pick up, hello, morning, bloody rubbish. Boom. <laughs> and you knew what he was talking about. But it, with the best will in the world, he was just such a, a lovely man. But I kept saying to him, Ken, your story is fabulous. Can we please do, can I do your autobiography? No, 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 no. Well, who would want to read about me? No, no, no. Well, when he passed away, the very first thing I did was go to his sons, Kenneth Jr. and Bobby, and said, I really, they said, yeah, it needs to be done, it needs to be done, and mum will, will, will participate. And Nora, of course, they'd been married, I think, 60-odd years. They were just childhood sweet. It was a wonderful story. And she passed away six months later, very, very suddenly. But I got to see her beforehand. And I discovered, actually, interestingly enough, that there was a lot of parallels between Ken and me that I hadn't realised. Ken had been in the RAF. My father had been in the RAF. Ken had been stationed in Scotland. My father had been stationed in Wales. Ken had met Nora, his wife, at a dance in Edinburgh. My dad had met my mum in Cardiff uh, at, a, at a dance. Uh, they both had gone back to their respective homes. Nora had come down to live with Ken's mum and dad, didn't get on. My mum was taken across to Northern Ireland, didn't get on with her mother-in-law. The whole thing, and they had to move out and build their own houses, exactly as they had to do. So there was a huge number of parallels, although we didn't perhaps realise it at the time, but it was just all part of the story. So to be able to write this and to have Jackie Stewart do the, uh, the, the introduction was just was lovely. It was, it was something I was very, very pleased to be able to do. And poor old Nora passing away not long after it was, you know, we'd, we'd got the job done. So there's a, a new book, not, not by, by Morris, but another author about the, uh, the Ken Terrell team. Um, and I can give you a mm. sneak bit of information here, insider information from Brooklands. Uh, it's being launched on the 10th of July, so you can pencil that date in. There'll be a talk in the evening. Every living Tyrrell driver has been invited to come along. I'm not saying they're all going to turn up, obviously, but every living Tyrrell driver has been invited along. And that Morris is uh, going to be part of the, uh, the interviewing panel. We don't know exactly how it's going to play out, but uh, that's a date for your diary. Mon Monday, the, the 10th of July. Uh, for the, the Tyrrell story at Brooklands. Yeah, there's room for that because I focus mainly on Ken and, and the Formula One team and uh, all the rest of it. But there's a story to, to, to go behind what actually happened in the team, much more detailed than I could do with this. So uh, there's, a, there's a lot of room for that. Yeah, looking forward to that. Okay, so your kind of uh, current book, as it were, your most recent book is, of course, uh, Incredible and, and uh, Mur Murray Walker. Yeah. Um, again, uh, when Murray passed away, um, my literary agent came on to me and said, have you seen the, the amount of stuff in the paper about Murray? It's incredible. He was so popular. I said, yeah, he was. He said, well, has anybody written about him? And he, Murray had done his own. His own book, yes. His own so, book, but yeah. it was 20 years. Time flies. 20 years before. Nobody's done anything since. And we'd had, a, I'd had lots of interviews with him. In fact, we'd had, had a series, a uh, magazine called F1 Racing. It's now called GP Racing. And they gave me a series called Lunch With whomever. And I did one with Murray here, just not far from here. I think in Lindhurst, we had lunch in a hotel. And uh, he was just such a fabulous personality. And we knew that this had to be done. And I thought the only way to make this work is to talk to people who knew him, of course, of which there were many. People who'd worked with him, of which there were many. And every person I went to, yes, I'll do it, absolutely. There's no, sometimes you go to people and they go, oh, I don't know, you know, I'm not, well, I didn't like them this much. Or, oh, no, no. Everybody wanted to do it, wanted to be part of it, wanted to have their say uh, uh, about this marvellous man. So it was an easy thing to do in that respect because I got loads of very good stuff and it was just a pleasure to be able to recount. Also uh, remember um, the very last commentary he did uh, was actually with me. It was one of those very strange circumstances that arise in that uh, he'd retired from TV in 2001, and in 2007 or eight, I think it was seven, I was doing Radio 5 Live, and David Croft, the main commentator, uh, had maternity leave, was, 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 wasn't able to come to the European Grand Prix. I think that would be paternity leave, in fact. Paternity, of course. Let, let you off you. on that one. <laughs> yes. Uh, and so he wasn't there. And so the producer, Jason Swales, had the brilliant idea of trying to get Murray to come back and, and do commentary. I said, well, give it a go. He might, he might do it. He did. And Murray came back 
and I actually sat with Murray in the commentary box, and it was incredible. He just was so full of enthusiasm, because he was then in his 80s, and he turned up early, he went to all the meetings, he wanted to be part of it. There was no prima donna, there was no, well, in my day we did it this way, or, well, of course, you may do it that way, but no, no he wanted to know exactly how to do it. And can I, have I got time to say, the, the, funny, the funniest part for me was um, he was doing qualifying and then we're going to do the race, okay? So uh, it was in Saturday Sport on, on Radio 5 Live, and the sport was being handled from Carnoustie. The British Open was on at the same time. And John Inverdale was, 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 was masterminding the whole afternoon sport from Carnoustie. So it came time for us to do qualifying. So we had the producer in London saying, right, OK, we're coming to you soon. John Inverdale is about to hand over. And Inverdale started this big monologue about, well, this is a big moment. I thought would never happen. We are about to hear, going on about the pit. And as this is happening, I could see the cars leaving the pits starting to go out for qualifying. And Murray's he's sitting, he's sitting at the desk, and he's on his and, and then we're going on and on, this voice, this wonderful voice, we're about to hear it all again. And, went, oh. and, and in the end, he thumps the desk, and I tell him to get on with it. And, and so he says all this stuff, out it comes, and comes up with this lovely stuff. And instead of Murray going, well, thank you, John, it really is a privilege to go back, because radio was my roots, as we're all stuff. Oh, no. And round 10, qualifying, it has begun! <laughs> <laughs> and off he went. And that was Murray. And off he went. It was just, his enthusiasm was just coming out of his pores. It was fabulous. F fantastic stories with, with Murray, and equally fantastic stories with, uh, with, with, with Nicky Loud. And now, th there's yeah. quite, quite, quite a story behind this uh, photograph, because he didn't see it for years and years and years. And when he saw it, he said to you, who, who took that photograph and what yeah. was the answer? I did. <laughs> uh, this was at um, Mallory Park in 1971, March 1971. So it's the first round of the European Formula 2 Championship. And uh, it's the first serious race we've had after a winter of, you know, you're itching to go again. And I'm a, I'm a fan, I'm a salesman at this time. So I go up to Mallory Park and just get immersed in the whole thing. And I've got, I, I had visions about being a photographer rather than being a journalist. I didn't know what I wanted to do. And I, I was taking lots of shots. And I was wandering around the paddock, and the March team, of which he was part of, Nicky was part of, uh, Ronnie Peterson was in the other car. There was a huge crowd around Ronnie's car. They're getting ready to go out and practice. And here's this little kid who I looked in the program, Nicky Lauda, never heard of him. Uh, and some uh, bank, Austrian bank sponsoring him. And I just went over, and there was nobody about, and I just took this picture. I thought no more about it. And 40 years plus, um, we, when we got to know each other really well, I bring it out and I show it to him, and he goes, who took this? And I said, I did. Why? And I said, uh, <laughs> uh, well, I don't know. I was a wanker. Why did you take this picture? And I said, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, Nicky. I don't know, but they're, oh. And he was really fascinated by the fact he kept going on about the ring on his finger. He said, I have this ring. Why have I got that? I wasn't married. I thought it looked good. Stupid, huh? And, there was, <laughs> so he was, uh, and that was, that was Nicky. That was to think about what, here we are. We're talking about it here, actually. This is, this is actually the, the time we're talking about it. To think what had happened to him in that intervening period. You think about what he'd been through in there. And here's me having made it into Formula One. So it was a, a, a nice sort of uh, squaring the circle, if you like. Yeah, it's, um, <clears throat> Excuse me, that's a great read, the, uh, the Nicky Lauda book. If you haven't read Morris's book on Nicky Lauda, I can uh, thoroughly recommend that one. You'll, you'll read it in 48 hours, I would say. So a bit more media work now. We're in the, uh, the, the, the Middle East here. Oh, yeah. Abu Dhabi. Yeah. Uh, there was a guy called, when, when, when Abu Dhabi wanted to start the Grand Prix, a brilliant move they made was they got a guy called Richard Cregan to come and be the general manager because Richard had been, he was an Aer Lingus engineer, initially. He then became a mechanic on the Toyota rally team because he was nuts about rallying as all most Irish people are. He then managed the Toyota uh, rally team. Then when he went to Formula One, he became manager of the Toyota Formula One team. And then when Abu Dhabi decided to hold a Grand Prix, they, they thought, we don't know anything about Formula One. So they got Richard in to be the general manager of the Abu Dhabi Grand Prix. Uh, and he was perfect for the job because he knew exactly what the Formula One teams would want. He knew exactly how the pits should be laid out, the paddocks should be laid out, where this should be the power points, all the detail. He had it all. And for me, it was lucky because he said to me, look, uh, we need a bit of help with the media. You're the man. So 
I got involved in doing all sorts of things in Abu Dhabi for seven or eight wonderful years. And one of the things was doing uh, work for Abu Dhabi TV, which was just great because it's a fantastic. So the only thing I would say about Abu Dhabi is that they started from scratch and they didn't do a particularly good circuit. They, they could have done so much better. But everything else, I'm talking about the layout, by the way, everything else is a wonderful, wonderful event. But the track itself is a bit, bit lousy. So we're going to move on to uh, Morris Hamilton in, in a few interesting cars now oh. in, in, in your career. And what, one of the most interesting, the, uh, the two-seat Formula One car. Yeah. This is you looking a little bit apprehensive in yeah. the back there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. So being involved in Abu Dhabi, I got, I got first call in a lot of stuff, one of which was in the uh, Formula One two-seater, which they had down there, uh, which was actually was an old Tyrrell, funnily enough, with uh, a Cosworth V10 in the back and a Judd V10 in the back. And uh, John O'Lazy, who you see here, was going to be taking journalists around on a pre-Grand Prix uh, little package. And on the night before, I'd had dinner with John O'Lazy and Johnny Herbert. And Herbert was winding O'Lazy up and telling him that, I don't know if we can switch to it, Harry, but yeah. yeah. So there's a, a, cor there's a series of corners. So, so they come out of the pits, they come around this, the lap, Okay, right round here, right round here. Now, these corners here, that one's flat. That one is flat maybe because it's leading almost immediately to heavy braking into this corner here under the hotel. There's the hotel, okay? And Herbert said to Alesi, you can't take this one flat, not in a two-seater with somebody behind you. And said, oh, yes, I can, yes, I can, yes, I can. And so anyway, comes the day, next day, and Alesi gets me in the car first, and the paddock marshal is there, and he's saying, OK, we've got a lot to get through today. Jean, do an out lap, do a flying lap, in. OK, got it? Yes. OK, 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 OK. Off we go, do the out lap, flying lap. We come to this corner here, and he lifts off. Ah, he can't do it, Jean, he can't do it. We go round, and he doesn't come in. He carries on for another lap, and I think, uh-oh, I know exactly what's going to happen here. He's <laughs> going to give it a go. And sure enough, in the next lap, we go, and he takes it flat. But we lock up and we end up leaving black marks all over this lovely green paint work here and all sideways and nearly hit the barrier there. And when we came back to the pit lane, the marshal is standing with his arms folded and his clipboard underneath. He is furious. <laughs> and, and John goes, but I had to do it. And this is him and I talking about it afterwards. He's, I had to, I had to do it, I had to do it, I had to do it. It was just a fantastic sensation. To be, and to be in a Formula One car doing that sort of speed with the telemetry show we were doing, I get this right, 187.3 miles an hour on the back straight. That was just wonderful. Can, can you see much? You, see, you seem to no. have a bit, a bit of a sort of barrier up in front of you there. You, you, you can't don't. really see much. No, you don't. You, and, and also the thing, even though, even though you've got, the strange thing is, even though you, you have this here, your helmet is being lifted off your head going down the straight. It's just the wind's getting underneath. You're just having to pull it down. And what I wasn't used to, Harry, was, I mean, I expected the acceleration to be mm -hmm. phenomenal, which it was. Just back to the gears, boom, boom, boom. And the braking, your head goes onto your chest and you cannot lift it off because they're G-forces. But what I didn't know about was the violence in the cockpit as you're going across the curves, bang, and back and forth, and, and the, the, the G-forces on, on, on all sides. Mm -hmm. So that when we got to the end, I mean, as you can see that previous picture, I was exhausted. And I've been just sitting. <laughs> right, I'm not strapped in that tightly, but it is very, very tiring. And I'm thinking, they do this for an hour and a half. All right, they're, they're strapped into a cockpit that's meant to hug them. Um, and they're racing as well. And my respect for them went through the roof. It was a high enough already, but it was amazing. Their, 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 their endurance. So we'll, we'll, we'll scroll through a few, a few very famous and beautiful cars that you've been lucky enough to, to passenger in. So uh, tell, tell us about this one. The Ferrari 330p4, one of the most beautiful cars, I think, ever made. And the story behind this, and it's funny how things come full circle. If you recall that very first photograph I showed uh, we showed you off the pits and Dundrod and I'm the little boy in the schoolboy cap. And Bob Gerrard is sitting in the car. His co-driver was a man called David Clark. And he's in the background of the picture, OK? Now, David Clark and I were to meet 20-odd years later here at Oakton Park. In, this is uh, about 1978. Uh, David Clark was a very wealthy businessman. Uh, and, he, and he ran a company called Grey Paul Motors that dealt in Ferraris. And he bought this 330p4 that had won at Daytona 
in 68 with Chris Amon, who's driving the car here. And Autocar magazine, Peter Windsor, had done a deal to get Eamon to re be reunited with this Ferrari at Oton Park. And I got in on the act, as usual. And that's me here, sitting beside Chris Eamon in this car, around Oton Park. I mean, the noise, the sound of that car, and to have to sit beside Chris Eamon was... Well, yeah, absolutely. Seven, seven. Great, great driver. Never really had the success that he uh, that he that he deserved. Never won a Grand Prix. No. Um, Le Mans <laughs> winning Renault. Didier Peroni, and me. Now look. So this is the this is the Renault that won the 1978 Le Mans 24 Hours. Right. Renault were doing a press junket at the end of the year to celebrate their winning at Paul Ricard, and they were putting journalists in the car with Peroni. And look, I've got a lap and diagonal belt on. That's all I've got. Not a harness. I'm sitting with a jumper on, right? I've got a helmet that's got my name on. Well, that fat lot of good that's going to do. But, but that is it. Well, I was quite, and, and they said, hang on, hold on. To the, to the that was it. But hey, he didn't care. He got in. So Peroni, he's been doing this all day, right, taking this round. And I got to know him very well when he was with, with Turo. So he was giving the thing a bit of sideways. We were using the short circuit, which has got twists and turns in it. And then go along the Mistral Strait, through scene, which has taken about 170, 180 miles an hour flat. And then you're on the brakes for Bose, which is a, a, a tight right-hander. And all the while, he's, he's, going, he's, he's looking across at me, thumbs up, and it's all, you know, flat, no problem at all. He hits the brakes for the Bose, and the car suddenly goes sideways, and then this way, and then that way. And I can tell by his movements on the, that this is not in the script at all. <laughs> And he holds it, and he powers around the corner, and there, on the verge, is René Arnoux with a Formula One car going. <laughs> His engine had blown up, and he'd left oil all the way around the corner, and there were no marshals. That's the other thing. I'm doing this, yeah, and there's no, no marshals, there's nothing, no safety. And, and Peroni had found the oil, and Arnoux's going, <laughs> like this, as he went by. And DDA says, I'm sorry about the oil. And I said, don't worry, boy, it was great. It was lovely. So, so here we have Hamilton and Hamilton. Uh, yeah. um, so, I mean, di digressing from your, from your own story for a moment, I mean, Lewis Hamilton, obviously you, you can't fault the, the weight of his achievements and, no. and, and his accomplishments, but, no. you know, is, as a driver on, on pure talent and pure merit, is he, is he right up there? Is, oh. he, is he a Senna? Is he a Schumacher? Oh, he's got to be. It absolutely has to be. And, and to do this, uh, I'm not very good at maths, but, but this would be his 17th, I think, consecutive season in Formula One. Or his uh, longevity is unbelievable. That, that, yeah. I mean, you think about that, the commitment the need, the hunger to do it, and he will be as hungry as ever and as fast as ever. I think he's driving better than ever because the maturity that's coming with it. Uh, he was, from the moment uh, I was commentating on the 2007 Australian Grand Prix, his first Grand Prix, and he ran around the outside of Fernando Alonso at the first corner. I went, what? Look at that. And from then on, and he won uh, the Canadian Grand Prix and then the United States Grand Prix that year. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely amazing. Yeah, I mean, if you think of previous eras, like Jody Schachter, one championship, retires. James Hunt, one championship, yeah. retires. A, a completely different mindset from, uh, from Hamilton. Yes, absolutely. And th this is at a press day. Uh, so it's the McLaren days, obviously. I think it was 08 at Silverstone, prior to the British Grand Prix, and it was wet. And they've got an AMG Mercedes of some sort. Don't ask me which one it is, but it's very quick. I remember the first part of the lap, Lewis is fiddling around. He's trying to turn the traction control off. <laughs> so he can get the thing sideways. And here, this is going through Stowe in the wet. And you can see that Lewis is thinking about it because we're sideways. And he's just holding on to it because they play with it. I mean, the thing that... The From thing the look of your face, you're thinking about it as well, Morris. I am. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I am. I think, Jesus, Lewis, is this all right? But these guys, they make the car talk. The car, it, he's not, the car hasn't gone sideways and he's catching it. It's gone sideways because he wants it to go sideways. He's, it's make, he's making it do what he wants it to do. He's in total control. They're, they're just finger trip control, and they're talking to you while they're doing it. Oh, it's a different world. They're a different planet. So, so Morris's other skill set is as a navigator. Anybody know he's a navigator on, on, on stage rallies? Oh, no. Donegal Rally. Donegal Rally, here he is, with Tony Jardine, I think, yeah, driving. Yeah, yeah. Uh, going over a yump. And that's why I mean, I'm sinking down the seat. We're going over the yump, but I'm down the seat. Uh, that was um, a WRC Skoda, which we we borrowed, and the thing was a rocket ship, absolute rocket with water cooled brakes and goodness knows what. And uh, we had the time of our lives. It took us a day to get used to it. Uh, I couldn't get, I mean, both of us, because Tony was trying to get used to the speed and the acceleration, and I was trying to get used to 
having to up my pace and reading the notes because we were arriving at corners that much faster. The whole thing was so quick. And the Donegal Rally, if, you, if you're into rallying, if you've never been, you must go. It is just beautiful. Mm -hmm. Great rally. So this is, um, I think, is it Derek Warwick doing the yeah. RAC, as it was then, the RAC rally? Yeah, 1991, I think. And uh, Derek has done a deal with David Richards of ProDrive to do is, this. is this Derek here? That's Derek yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he's, there's a test going on up in Kielder. And it's his first experience with the, with the rally car. And he's given it a lot of thought because he's suddenly realizing that it's one thing to agree to do something like this in a sunny paddock in Spain or somewhere, to be confronted in November in Kielder Forest in the mud and the dirt and the rest of it. And my God, this thing is totally different. And prior to this picture being taken, Marco Olen, who's in the other Subaru, it's just behind, had taken Derek for a run around the special stage. And I talk about opening Derek's eyes. He was just, couldn't believe what, uh, what Alain had done in the car. I mean, it was extraordinary. This, this guy is just a hero. He's just 18 World Championship rallies. Um, and he's, yeah, he's just so, he, was, he took me for a, a lap afterwards. And uh, at the end, he, he called, we had dinner the night before in the hotel up in, in Kielder. And he referred to Derek and I as Formula One. Hey, Formula One. He just called us Formula One. Never called Derek, Derek. Formula One, OK. And me, Form Formula One, OK. So <laughs> at the end of the day, in this pr in previous test, um, Derek had been going round and round and round and, and trying to get used to it. Mark had been doing his test with his te it was co-driver Ilka Kivimaki. And they finished. And they're about to finish. And Mark goes, Formula One, in. Pointing to the co-driver's seat for me to get in. And I've, I've never experienced anything in my life. I mean, he was like, he was trying to kill the car with his feet, banging on the pedals, bang, 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 boom, 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 everywhere. It was just an unbelievable speed that he was doing and commitment completely sideways everywhere. So he was madman, but controlled madman. Just extraordinary. And is, is this you just, just after uh, that? Uh, here, no, here no, right no, in. this is another story. This is, <laughs> have we got time, we got time for this? Yeah, we have. Yeah, time Very for quick. this, yeah. Um, this is a year on, all right? And ProDrive, I've got a press day prior to the uh, RAC rally the next year, OK? And what they've done is they've brought all the journalists up, and they've got Pro Marco Allen to take the, the, the media on they'd, a little special stage that they'd made around a farm up in Oxfordshire. And I mean, you feel sorry for somebody like Marco Allen. You know, all he wants to do is drive fast, and he's got to take these sponsors, guests, and journalists around. He's got to be fairly controlled, show them what it's like, but quite monotonous. So I'm last to go, and he, I get into the car, and, uh, and he goes, Marco, you've been in a rally car before? And I said, uh, yeah. Do you remember Marco Kilder last year? Formula ah, Formula One. OK, I remember. OK, I have 50 brick horse more. I show, boom, and off we go. Right. <laughs> and he goes mental again, and all the way around the stage. But we get to the end of the stage. There's, uh, they come along the side of a field, and they're supposed to drive around a barn around the barn, past the farmhouse, and back to where the motorhome's set up for all the coffees and where all the guests can go. And as you come to the end of the field, there's a red board to say, that's it. He comes flat out through the red board, sideways around the back of the barn, sideways into the farmyard, and there's all this cow shit and everything. It goes all over the cars of all these directors of, of, of <laughs> everywhere. And he, and he arrives sideways in front of them, and people are dropping their cups of coffee and going, oh my god. <laughs> And he stops the car and he goes, OK, good Formula One. Eh? And smacks him in the knee. <laughs> <laughs> well, not, not nearly as exciting as that, but uh, last year I introduced Morris to um, historic rallying in, uh, in uh, my Audi, 1983 Audi. We did an, an, an historic rally mm. t t t together with uh, Morris on the, on, on the maps. Do you, do you want to just give a, a word about how, how, how that went? We, we didn't do terribly well, did we? But oh. it was... It was your first historic rally, and it is a whole different world, Morris. I've never done so badly going so slowly. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> no disrespect, Harry. You have to go slowly. Sorry, I'm yeah. not saying you're slow. No, I don't it, mean. It's a different discipline entirely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does anybody here do historic rallying? You know what we're talking about, map maps and everything, and regularity rallying? Yeah, a few of you do regularity rallying. It's a, it's a completely different world to stage rallying. It is. It is. I learned a lot during that. It was a lot of fun, but it was a lot of pressure going very, to go slowly, <laughs> I can believe, trying to go slowly, slow down, no, slow down, going too fast, too slow, too fast, no, too, oh, that was great fun. Can we do another one? We can do another one, yeah, there's another yeah. one coming up, yeah, so, uh, Morris wants us to go to the organisers and have our, have our work marked.
<laughs> to, uh, to find out, you know, exactly well, where, how did we, yeah. where, where did we actually lose that time or gain time? Because that's a stupid thing. If you, if well, you'd... the results came out and we were bottom, and I thought, why the hell did that happen? I know we were bad, but that's ridiculous. <laughs> So what, what are you doing then currently? You're, you're not, not obviously retired, Mara, still, no. still working? Yes, uh, I've got a regular column in motorsport, of which this is one example, where during the late 80s and 90s, I had a Canon sure shot camera. I don't know if you're familiar with it. You literally, it's idiot proof. You just pick it up, push the button, and it focuses automatically. There's no telephoto lens, there's no settings, just bang, bang, bang. Stood me down to the ground. So during uh, that period, I would take pictures to illustrate a column I was writing for a South African magazine. And um, I used to be really mad because uh, I would get the picture, and because there was no lens, the subject would be small in the center, and there'd be all this periphery stuff. And I think, oh, for goodness sake. Now, looking at it 30 years plus on, the periphery stuff is so interesting because everything has changed so much that the, the periphery is now a story in itself. And this was a, a lovely one here of, uh, of uh, Ivan Capelli feeding seagulls after the finish of the Canadian Grand Prix. And uh, there's a bit of a subtext to that in that somebody came hurtling through and killed some of the seagulls in a, in a van and he went apeshit. But um, yeah, so I'm doing that every month mm -hmm. uh, using these pictures, which I thought yeah, there's they, no they more use for it. Tremendous. It's always the, when I get my motorsport, it's always the, the first page I turn to as, as your Good column. Good man, Harry. And there are, uh, Have you met my agent? <laughs> <laughs> there, there are some, uh, some great stories there. And as you say, it's the quirky little sort of off-the-wall stories. Yeah. It's not the mainstream stories. It's that sort of quirkiness, behind-the-scenes kind of stories that, uh, that the, the, the photographs tell. That's right. It's the it's stuff so at the time you're going, oh, God, this, who's interested in this? But 30 years on, you really are interested because things have changed so much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So... Um, Morris, we're, we're near, near, nearly finished now, but we've talked obviously about many highs that you've had uh, throughout your, uh, your, your, your career. But I mean, it was a, a tough job climbing up that ladder, and there must have been some, uh, some like pretty, pretty low lows al along the way. Was, was there anything that particularly inspired you and uh, kept you going during the more difficult periods? Uh, yes, there was one particular period. Um, if you remember uh, when I'd written the first article about Monaco with my dad about being a spectator. And I'd written the piece and sent it out to magazines, and, and nothing had happened. I mean, I thought the phone was going to ring off the hook. Yeah, right. Uh, and I just wondered, well, what do I have to do? How do I? It just seemed to be no way. Uh, maybe my writing wasn't good enough. Um, I didn't know anybody. What was I going to do? And coincidentally, uh, a man called Hugh Greer, who played rugby for Ireland, was a second-hand bookseller in Belfast. And he, he knew my dad well. and. He came round to the house. I was back um, for for Christmas, and he gave me this book. And he said, "You might want to." He said, "This just came in the other day. You might want to read this. It's about Rudolf Caracciola, uh, a, a Grand Prix driver." Now, I'd heard of Caracciola because my dad knew all about Caracciola, because Caracciola had won. I remember I was talking about the TT races in Northern Ireland. Well, initially they used to be on the Ards circuit, which was even longer, 13 miles long. My dad had seen Caracciola win the TT in 1929. So he knew all about him. I knew nothing. So I said, oh, yeah, I'll have a read of this. So I read this story about Rudolf Caracciola, and I was amazed because he, from the age of 14, wanted to be a Grand Prix driver. Now, in those days, this is the 1930s, it was like saying you wanted to fly to the moon. You know, there's just there's no way. Because Grand Prix racing then was for the rich, the wealthy, and the, the privileged. There was just no way you could get in. And he was a humble guy. Uh, his father was a hotelier, I think. And he did an engineering apprentice, and he went to Mercedes in Stuttgart, and he said he wanted to be a Grand Prix driver. And they just said, yeah, right. And he said, why don't you just try selling cars, which he did. And he then persuaded them to lend them, him a saloon car for a hill climb, which he won. So then they gave him something else, and he won with that. And one thing or another, and there was a Grand Prix, there was a weekend when uh, Grand Prix clashed, and Mercedes were sending their works team to wherever, the Tripoli or wherever it was. But the local one was, was going to be nobody at it. He persuaded them to lend him the, what was the backup car, and he won. So one thing led to another, and they took him on as their works driver, and he won Grand Prix. So suddenly they were realized, and he realized, he really was a good driver. Then Mercedes withdrew. Just as he's about to make it, they had to withdraw for financial reasons. So Alfa Romeo signed him up. He did a year with them, 
and they quit. Oh, what am I going to do now? So a, a, another driver called Louis Chiron and he combined together and they bought an Alfa Romeo and they were going to run their own team, the, the car each, they were going to run their own team. The very first Grand Prix was Monaco. And during practice, the brakes failed on uh, Caracciola's car. And he had a choice of going into the harbour or hitting the wall at the back. And he slammed into the wall at about 60, 70 miles an hour. And it completely destroyed his upper leg, his right leg, and his thigh, and his, 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 his pelvis. And he described, it in, he described it in the book about uh, being removed from the car and the pain, like we said, was from the tips of his toes to the roots of his hair. And they sat him on a chair in the tobacconist's kiosk, which is right there. And then they put him in an ambulance. They manhandled him into an ambulance. And he said it was like red-hot pokers all over his body as the ambulance went across the bumps. In those days, they didn't have physio like we've got today. They took a look. They did an x-ray. They took a look. They put him in plaster for four months, five months. And during that time, he didn't know whether he'd be able to walk again, never mind drive a car. They took the plaster off, they took another x-ray, they put it back on again for another month. During that time, he's recuperating in the, in the Swiss Alps. His, his wife, Charlie, who he'd met as a sweetheart a long time ago, is killed in an avalanche. And you think, what more can happen to this man? And he still didn't know what was going to happen. And the man that I pointed out, um, Alfred Nyabar, the big portly team manager in the Mercedes picture earlier on, he come to, uh, to Cracholi, he knew he was good, and he said, look, we're coming back. Mercedes are coming back to Formula One. If you're fit, I'll have you. We're going to have a test shortly. And he, hobbled, he took, the plaster off, took the plaster off. He hobbled along to the, the, the test in great pain, but was quick for one lap, quick enough to be signed up. And for the rest of his career, for the rest up until the outbreak of World War II, he drove in massive pain. You can imagine the right leg. His, his right leg was two inches shorter than his left. And the pain every time he put his foot in the brake to push it was searing, but he carried on. He won a, over 140 races. In, th in those days, there was no uh, world championship, as we, as we know it now, but he was European champion three times, which is the equivalent of being world champion. So he was brilliant. He died in actual, a natural death, actually, in his late 50s of liver trouble, but he survived all that. He worked his way through it. Now, now, why am I telling you this? The reason I'm telling you this is that this here, you'll see, is the opening line of the first chapter. It is my belief that everyone can achieve the goal he or she strives for. It is also my belief that the, every man who desires for a certain vocation is strong enough will ultimately get his wish, no matter how circuitous the manner in which this comes about. I read that. Having read the book, I read it, and everything I've told you, I read that again, and I thought, that's incredible. So I, I wrote it out longhand on a piece of paper, shoved it above my desk, and thought, come on. And so that then led me to go to, uh, I thought, right, you're a salesman. You've sent this article out. Why don't you go and sell yourself? And I, I sold myself to Competition Car, and Nigel Roebuck published the article. That was my inspiration to the point now where I still keep it. This is... I've now done it all nice and smart. and still on my office wall now because I think the message here is if, as he says, you believe in something and want to do it and it's in your heart you want to do it, do it because you'll get there. And that was proof of it and it's all in here. And that was my, my, uh, that's my takeaway from this. Excellent. Thank you very much, Morris. Big, big hand, please, for, for Morris. Thank you. And can, I, can I just say... Just say Thank you to my right-hand man, Harry, here for guiding me through this so expertly. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.